The surface story is not true, but that doesn't mean it's just fabrication. It means that the fabrication is being done by some other force. This is our humble hemp patch. 5,000 years of medical cannabis use. We're learning about other cannabinoids. Marijuana is grown in every state in the union. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. The overwhelming claims about flying saucers and impossible flight patterns are impossible to deny or to confirm. There are too many consistencies over the centuries, but not enough hard evidence. The fairy folk and angels of days gone by have been replaced with science fiction creatures from space. But a rose by any other name is still a strange spirit. This is not a field I know well, as you'll hear in my opening anecdote. There's so much information here that separating the wheat from the chaff feels impossible. That's why Eric Davis is such a great guide to this space. He can help us figure out what these visitations mean without worrying over their elusive material nature. As the acclaimed author of Technosis and High Weirdness, he's no stranger to the other sides of human existence. And he's one of the best lecturers and most thoughtful public intellectuals of this generation. His writing is inspiring. His talks are concrete, well thought out, and personally challenging. So whether you're an old hand at UFO culture, or you're just realizing the power of these ideas, Eric Davis can turn the question itself into the hero's journey. As long as you keep connection with your body and your critical faculties, maybe it's okay to not know what you believe. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with Dr. Eric Davis. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. I wanted to start this talking about UFOs as they're getting more in the news, the Department of Defense, and begin by saying that for a lot of the topics on this show that I cover, I know something about or a decent amount about them. And on this one, I know really little. And so I wanted to start by doing what most people do when they face an expert is share the little bit that they know um, in the field that the expert obviously knows really well. And I thought this might help the listeners because it's actually a good bit of hubris as well. Uh, because I read the first half of a history book on this subject, and it was called The Flying Sauces Have Landed by Jordan, Adam, uh, George Adamski uh, from the early 50s. And I didn't even get to finish it because it's, now it's on a ship somewhere on the ocean with the rest of our stuff. And it was really eye-opening to see that and all of his descriptions from the Holy Books of India about flying objects and then exhaustive lists of sightings through the 16th and 17th century. Uh, I didn't realize how much was in newspapers from those times before anything was flying in the land. And by the time we got to the modern age, he just stopped cataloging all the newspaper reports because there were so many of seeing unexplained lights and vehicles and things like that. And so as a scientist, I felt a little bit silly for being so dismissive about this when there was so much anecdotal evidence that goes so far back into history. So reading that book or the first half, it was kind of a big deal for me, realizing that there's more here than I ever realized. Um, and then for the big kicker of the hubris, Eric, the very last essay I read from you about UFOs, right before starting this interview, you called the author of that book, George uh, Adamski, a loon, <laughs> <laughs> an, untrust an untrustworthy character. And so that is my main source of information that got me so excited about this. And so I guess my first question is, does that story sound familiar to you as you talk to people in this world? Uh, yeah, that makes that makes some sense. I mean, I want to clarify that that usually I don't actually uh, go quite as far as to call people uh, a loon, um, because even when people are fantasizing or, or inventing, uh, drawing from the creative imagination, if you will, and their depictions of their journeys through, you, you know, the UFO or the paranormal. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important to give space for for that process and for those stories. Um, I think what's particular about Adamski is that it it does it you know it, it holds up less, let's say, than a lot of other stuff, and it's uh, it's very clearly more about the religious imagination and the esoteric than it is about um, some of the more concrete evidence for UFOs that uh, come up in other parts of the literature. I mean, and one way that I think it, usually I try to approach these things historically, and one way of thinking, well, what's interesting and unique 
uh, about Adamski is that he comes along at a certain point in time when up to that point, the relatively short uh, discussion about quote unquote UFOs or flying saucers, leaving aside all of these pre-1947 accounts that end up looking pretty similar in a lot of ways, um, is that up to that point, it had been very much a, a, a nuts and bolts question. You know, these are physical objects in the sky. Of course, initially, people didn't think didn't jump to the extraterrestrial hypothesis, though that happened relatively quickly. So it's just like there's these weird things that people are seeing. What do we do with that? And of course, the Air Force gets involved and they start doing their own investigation. What is this thing? And then they realize that they have a kind of public relations um, situation on their hand because there's all these people who believe and they now they have to kind of control that and so they start playing games with their information and what they're saying and even if many of the people involved in their studies did ultimately decide that there wasn't a phenomenon or even if there were these anecdotal reports that seemed significant that just because of what you know it, it calls into question so many features of reality that they were just like okay we're not going to we're not going to give this the light of day. So all that's going on, and it's really about this question of like physical objects. And then Adamski comes along, and he's basically like, yeah, I had an encounter with a being. I went on a ship. I saw all this stuff, and it, it's very fantastical, and it's kind of quasi-religious in some way, or, or visionary, let's say, visionary like visionary literature. And indeed, Adamski's own... Uh, you know, life shows that he was, you know, part of theosophical orders and he was interested in the esoteric, like a lot of people in California in the middle of the 20th century. You know, these aren't like new age psychedelic hippies. These are people who just for whatever reason get involved in theosophy or get involved in energy work or get involved in the I am movement. And there's all this weird stuff in California that is about, you know, other beings, other dimensions beings that have spiritual messages and that really is the story that starts with the damski is the is the contactee movement and the contactee movement are these you know it's sort of it, it, it flowers it blooms in the 1950s and it's about people who claim to have direct encounters with beings to go on ships and many of these beings have messages you know messages about you know either uh, the warnings that that uh, the human race is in danger of nuclear weapons, and then we got to get our act together, or or or, some, or we're going to blow up. Uh, they're often called space brothers because they take on some of the guise of these sort of higher order beings who have messages and teachings and wisdom, and ultimately that kind of stuff goes into the channeling literature, the new age channeling. A lot, some of the very some of the entities that you know, New Agers will later channel who are giving these kind of wisdom teachings, often in a somewhat garbled abstract language. A lot of those were actually beings that, or some of those were actually beings that were first uh, mentioned as part of this contactee literature. And so that's like a, in a way, a, a different branch of the whole UFO phenomenon that's that's separate in, in you know, some significant ways from the more, uh, what they call nuts and bolts conversation about actual physical craft, physical traces, radar, uh, you know, mark, scorch marks in the ground, pieces of metal, that kind of more physical conversation is sort of paralleled for a while uh, by a, quite a large movement of, of contactees, again, um, centered, but by no means um, uh, limited to uh, California. So that's sort of how, you know, Adamski is definitely playing a kind of fast and loose game with his with his stories, but they're clearly resonating on some archetypal level, and they definitely seem to kind of take off and then uh, inform other people's, not just their ideas, but their, their experiences. Before we get into the spiritual side more, I just want to ask about maybe an update on the federal agencies and what the Department of Defense has been coming out more on the physical side these last few years and opening up with some stuff that is fairly good evidence for things that don't make sense to what we know of current technology. Well, I mean, here, I mean, here we get into right away, like, you know, there's a lot of meta in the UFO, right? There's a lot of like, okay, we're having a conversation, but what are our 
what are our basic axioms that exist before we start having the conversation? And actually, let's talk about the axioms, you know, the underlying assumptions rather than the phenomena itself. And it's, uh, and, and this is, I think, a really important move, particularly at an era in an era where there's a lot of what you could call narrative warfare, where there's a lot of like gaming, and there's a lot of um, uh, sort of honey traps of beliefs. And I'm talking about conspiracy. I'm talking about you know news cycles. I'm talking about basic models of reality that are all sort of at play. So before you go and say, oh well, the you know it seems like there's something you know, happening uh, in the Department of Defense, and maybe there's some people who are finally have finally found some actual objects that we can study. And that, that would be, you know, of course, if there was a, a chunk of metal that that scientists could widely look at and widely uh, come to the conclusion that this was a, a, an artifact that was not made by human hands, which is part of the story behind the, the recent um, story, you know, quote unquote revelation or, or whatever you want to call before we get to that level which is in a way that's the honey trap is to go in there and go okay now there's something new and we're about to do that you have to step back and go okay what what's different about this story than what's come before and that's where you start to see these patterns over time and one of these patterns is that the the narratives around the UFO point towards some kind of imminent disclosure and they often talk about that word disclosure. It's not unlike the way that um, uh, you know the the you QAnon people talk about the Great Awakening. It's some point just in the future where suddenly all the the the, the veils are going to be parted, and we're finally going to be able to see the concrete evidence that, in the case of the UFO, some people believe the U.S. government has been sitting on since 1947. Um, or, you know, whatever the kind of backing story is. But that pattern of kind of getting up close to a disclosure and then somehow or another just nothing really exactly that satisfying happening is itself something that's occurred over and over and over again in the history of ufology. And so then you have to go, well, what's that about? What is that pattern about? Why is it happening now? What other characters and forces are at play who would be interested in that story? And those characters and forces could be um, groups within the you know defense agency that have a you know have an invested belief in these things. Sure, but there's also uh, you have to account for people who are interested in playing with information and disinformation, with people who are. Uh, uh, manipulating the story, if you will, for various other reasons. Those might have to do with Air Force uh, security, or those might have to do with entertainment. You know, since the since the 40s, the UFO has also been part and party of the entertainment industry, whether we're just talking about, you know, fiction films and, and you know, uh, B-movies, that's one level, but increasingly there's these whole, there are these institutes, there's um, all sorts of documentaries on, uh, on the History Channel and other sorts of, you know, media forces that are also interested in there being something like a, a gesture towards disclosure because it gets everybody's attention and you start paying, so you start paying more attention to it, it starts to become something that's trending. So all of those kind of media manipulations are also going on. It doesn't mean there's nothing there, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to say that there aren't anomalies, uh, whether those are, are physical anomalies, which I've never seen and I've never been particularly convinced by. And yet that's clearly part of the story. And there are other people I know who I respect who, who, you know, probably spend more time looking at this. This is not my central focus, but it's something I've looked at a lot. Uh, you know, who will say, no, 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 there is, I've been shown something. And then you get a story. And that's always the trick is that when you're approaching the UFO or other kinds of paranormal claims, you, you have to be really clear about where you actually sit in the kind of cycle or the circuit of claims and counterclaims and ideas and fantasies and desires. So in a way, it's a, it's a kind of almost a reflection of where you are. Um, and in that uh, process of reflecting on where you are and what you know and what the, how these 
stories that other people have about how things are work, well, it raises a lot of questions. How do you deal with these? How do you deal with these claims? Um, is it is the belief that there's actually some concrete bit of evidence, some chunk of metal somewhere in this story that would finally resolve everything? That very belief, that very drive and desire is already part of the phenomenon. So it's a very tricksy realm and you have to go in there with a bit of a trickster attitude, maybe not yourself being a trickster because there's plenty of those in ufology, but more being aware of that logic, whether it reflects specific human actors who are playing games or whether, as I also believe, there's something larger and more archetypal, more peculiar, more paranormal even that's happening that also has the character of a kind of trickster. Perhaps a few hundred years ago, people would have guessed that these were angels and dealt with them in a different way. But today it is an alien from another planet. And so what are some of the predominant theories of, as they evolve about what's happening here? Well, okay. I mean, the predominant theories are the, the, I mean, the extraterrestrial hypothesis remains strong. And you might say that has a couple of branches. One is that these are physical craft or maybe not quite entirely physical craft the way we think about it, but are, but are operating on uh, advanced physical principles, you know, forms of propulsion or, or uh, faster than light or wormholes or some kind of science activity and that these are being used and mostly they're they're in, inhabited or or, or uh, conducted by extraterrestrials though in some in some forms they they may be nazis from the bases on the moon but we'll leave that one aside um the uh so then that's sort of paralleled by um a kind of emphasis less on the physical craft and more on the abduction phenomenon which is sort of the dark side uh, dialectical response to the earlier contactee movement, which was pretty thumbs up. You know, the, the, the beings were pretty nice. Sometimes they looked like people. Uh, the, you know, they, there was a whole, all, all these different races, but a lot of them were, were, were positive and trying to help us out, the whole Space Brothers thing. And then at a certain point, the direct contact with the, the entities became more uh, creepy. Uh, and you get involved in the medical examination and kind of terror, terrifying stuff. And so there's a whole kind of zone of concern about ab- abductees, with that, which has to do with people's reports. Maybe people go under hypnosis and they report these deeper kinds of stories. Uh, and, you know, there's clearly something happening to these people. They're clearly traumatized in some real way. Um, there's a lot of consistency across the stories. It's hard to believe they're individually consciously making it up. So there's something going on on a kind of psychophysical level that is pretty intense and pretty peculiar. Um, uh, and so that's sort of another side of it. And then there's the whole thing that you're kind of already referring to about, you know, 300 years ago, maybe the same or something like the same uh, phenomena phenomenon is occurring but being interpreted differently because of the the status of the culture so this is more of like a kind of like a folkloric view um, but it's important to emphasize that at least the people that I follow who take this view who I think are the most interesting th- these are not people who just want to write it off like the way you would say oh that's just folklore that's just a uh, legendary that's just the human capacity to tell imaginative stories that have a certain sticking power so they spread through a culture these are people saying yes that's true but there's something there there's something in the uh, resemblance of so many a uh, contact um, in- encounters in the UFO literature with fairy lore and indeed if you start to look at this stuff there are all of these resonances across time you know, with fairies, with light seen in the sky. I mean, there's a huge compendium of accounts of these flying objects that go throughout uh, human history. You can be literalist then and say, well, these are real things that we're talking about. Or you stay at the level of like, look, there's some aspects of human experience or the way that human consciousness and, and the unconscious and the imagination 
encounter reality or physical reality. If there's something in that in that weird space that uh, produces these kinds of effects that then get organized differently over time. So it's a more open ended view that's not quite so materialist. And then you know, alongside all of these, you have debunkers or people who want to explain it away. Oh, this is just religion and a new guise. This is distortion. This is media um, infection. This is what happens when you have mediated stories about UFOs floating around in the cultural unconscious. And then those kind of shape and organize people's uh, extraordinary experiences. So they come out of these experiences with a story. And those stories often draw from lore that has already been part of the media cycle of entertainment media fiction uh, and so you get those kinds of loops too so it's really quite a um a broad uh, zone and actually i feel uh, compelled to say uh you know one more aspect of it that's really key is that um you know in a in a non big big time conspiratorial way it's pretty clear that there and i mean i think we actually know for sure that there has been uh, the active promotion of UFO ideas and um, in terms of the, you know, ufology as a kind of weird subculture by forces within the military industrial complex, partly because it becomes a very useful dodge for advanced weaponry. So the idea is here, you know, that the Air Force or the Navy or somebody has advanced weaponry and there's, there's, plenty of good reason to think that there's some kinds of advanced work. When we, some people believe these, these are using new physical principles and they're super radical and they're, you know, involved time dimensions and, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, very fringe uh, technology. Some people think, well, no, they're just advancements on what we have now, different crafts, different shapes. Well, if you're testing those things and then people see them and, and you have this whole culture of ufology that's not taken very seriously, well, then you can use that. So it's a very, very um, murky kind of weaponized space. And most people who go into it don't go in, go in there with naivete, not in saying that they're not thinking hard or they don't truly believe and they're not doing their own research as best they can, but that the whole information environment uh, of the UFO is gamed heavily. And so it becomes very difficult to extract signal from the noise. And so maybe the question would be, as a historian, how have you seen the common characteristics of UFO sightings change from the early 40s and 50s when it started to pick up through these last decades and as a reflection of maybe the overall culture going on around them? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, I think that, uh, well, there's a couple of things from our current environment. I mean, I think one of the more significant ones is the shift towards increasingly uh, disturbing accounts um, in terms of particularly the abduction literature. I mean, Whitley Strieber's kind of a version of this, um, you know, his, his books were tremendously uh, influential and his account, while it, he does, you know, kind of um, go back and forth on this in the sense that, uh, you know, in the end, he'll say that this is part of a kind of spiritual evolution, that these encounters are, are part of some larger process of, of learning and advancement. But the, the encounters themselves don't sound very much, don't sound very fun. Uh, they, they, it's much more like horror fiction uh, in terms of the, the genre than it, than it is like religious visionary literature in terms of encounter with higher higher beings. But then one of the you know fascinating things about Strieber is he puts out his his book communion and you know subsequent writings and he starts getting like these this voluminous amount of mail of people saying yeah I've had this experience I haven't told anybody about it here it is uh, and that that anecdotal uh, response happens over and over again. And so we, and we always have to take that seriously, whatever we ultimately think about what's going on, the, um, the overwhelming amount of anecdotal responses is just, it's too significant to, to just sweep under the carpet as like mass fiction making or something. And this, you know, even my own, um, my thesis advisor at a rice, 
uh, Jeffrey Kripal, who's who's sympathetic to to, to the paranormal uh, in a way that's very unusual for a, a working academic scholar. Um, but he has the same report, you know, because he is more sympathetic to not just UFO accounts, but accounts of, you know, higher beings or altered states of consciousness that have some kind of paranormal quality. And he talks about it openly. He also has one of these files, you know, where he says, well, I can't really tell you all these people because they swore me to secrecy. But believe me, I have like hundreds and hundreds of emails and conversations and letters that I've gotten from people going, oh, my God, you're finally saying it. I'm so glad there's somebody I can talk to. So that is part of the whole thing. Um that, that there's something going on and that it involves something around trauma and involves something around fear, it involves something around, uh, you know, sexuality in some ways, because some of these are, are very rapey uh, types of scenarios. And so that is a big shift from the 1950s where you don't really get stuff like that. I mean, you don't even really get that modern kind of, con- of abduction narrative until, until much later. So if this is sort of a big mirror, a big kind of, paranormal, paradoxical, paranoidal mirror that's held up to our current state of consciousness, our current state of, of, uh, you know, sort of political awareness I mean, in the broad sense of like the world we're actually inhabiting with other human beings and our stories about how it works. Um, there's clearly shifts. Uh, and, you know, in some ways I'm not, I'm not so convinced that, that, you know, now is the, it's not like now is the peak. In fact, in some ways this, latest air force you know the release of these videos and this uh you know discussion about groups that are that have contact with scientists who have actual pieces of metal all that it's not that different than things that have come before uh and again i speak not as a total nerd expert in in the zone but from my sort of one one or two steps removed uh perspective and it certainly doesn't seem quite as um uh novel and and it, as the explosions in the in the 80s and 90s around abduction and and other things i think it's it's also that the um uh there's sort of a sh- there, it, it, it feeds into a kind of larger conspiracy culture uh at the moment in a way that's uh also significant of how central conspiracy theories have come to uh to take, you know, take their place in the, in the mass imagination. Sponsor time. And it's one I'm very proud of. Just in time, we're releasing our newest product, CV Defense. It's a daily supplement for supporting the immune system. And while there's no CBD in this one, it's a hell of a list of ingredients. There's zinc, an essential trace element for proper immune function. There's selenium, a mineral essential for cellular defense. There's vitamin A that's essential for skin cells and the lining of mucous membranes, which protect you from the outside environment, and vitamin D, a vitamin that you probably hear a lot about already. And then for the big kicker, PEA, palmitto oil ethanol amide. This is one of the best studied components involved in the endocannabinoid system. It's actually something produced by our brains and bodies endogenously, and it's the ingredient I'm most excited about. It took me days to go through and categorize all the research that's been done so far on PEA. Dozens of clinical trials, hundreds and hundreds of papers. Go look it up. It is a fascinating molecule, and there's a reason it's being handled as the next great ingredient for stimulating the endocannabinoid system, and hence the immune system. I'm so glad that we have a product featuring PEA because I think it's so powerful. And then, last but not least, reishi mushroom extract often called the mushrooms of immortality. So as always, we make no medical claims for these products, but they might make you live forever. And in the highest praise I know, when my wife, who knows a lot about these things, looked at this list, she nodded judiciously and said, that looks really good. So in these trying times, I'm quite proud to introduce CV Defense for supporting your immune system every day. To try it for 20% off, use the coupon code LEXFILES at CVSciences Dot com. I would think one of the interesting things is what you're saying about all the anecdotal reports and that mirror. And one of the t- one of the things that's happened during this time is the rise of more drugs by more people as well. And I was wondering how that might have been playing into this with the drug experiences that often lead to kind of contacts and, and seeing things. 
Oh yeah, I think that's a really interesting angle that doesn't isn't as explicit in a lot of the conversations about ufology, but I think it's really important. A um, couple things to say about that. One is that you have to like look at well, where is the where is the drug culture first making its mark? You know, and so if we look at the drug culture as you know becoming more popular in the in the nineteen sixties, late nineteen sixties. It very much accompanies a, a larger occult revival. There's more and more books about occultism, about the paranormal, about ESP, about Loch Ness Monster, about witchcraft, about Satanism. You know, this whole, you know, opening to these deep levels of the of imagination and of altered states and the way that altered states and the imagination f- overlap. And that's really, really key is that we're never just talking about altered states and we're never just talking about the imagination. It's We're talking about the way that these things cross over. That's why, for example, hypnosis is so such an important and controversial element of, uh, of the UF, of ufology. Because, you know, on the one hand, people say, hey, if we use hypnosis, then we can go beneath the surface. Notice the metaphor. We can peel back the surface consciousness and find the deep memory of these bizarre experiences that the waking consciousness can't even really accept. So we'll go into hypnosis as a way to uncover these hidden truths. And that's, you know, in a way that whole setup of like, there's a surface story, you peel back the surface, you get to the hidden truths beneath. That's already not unlike conspiracy. It's not, you know, it's a certain way of thinking about the world that has a lot of power, but also a lot of potential pitfalls. But then there's the flip side. So you start doing this, you start having people who are having anomalous memories or uh, or actually memory dropouts, or they're having problems and you go to a hypnotherapist and they go and they discover that there are these deep memories of being abducted, not unlike the kind of deep memories that other people claim about uh, satanic uh, child abuse or something. And that, that was also happening around the same time as this these abduction narratives became more and more powerful. So there, uh, there, then you have the kind of debunking side where it's like, well, no, actually what's happening is that pe- people are going to hit into hypnotic states, which are altered states where you sort of lose the immediate, uh, you know, reality frame or reality, reality testing becomes very difficult in a hypnotic or semi hypnotic state. And so then people are kind of just constructing these narratives, except now they look like experiences because you're, that's part of the nature of the hypnotic state. And my very little experience with hypnosis would say that this is true, uh, that, that the kinds of experiences you have there, you're like, no, 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 that was really, really real. I mean, this, this goes into the question also about hypnagogia, that, that borderline between sleep and awakening. And if you go and go into abducting narratives, a lot of times they're on their bed, they're sleeping, something happens. And I've had personally a number of very striking, um, hypnagogic experiences that had elements even of these stories. Um, but I just don't, I, you know, I just have a kind of naturally critical agnostic temperament. So, I mean, it's like, I've personally had experiences that if I wanted to put them together, like, Oh, I had this dream here and this experience and this weird hypnagogic thing where I thought this was happening and this memory from childhood of some triangle on my wall or, you know, put things together. I realize, Oh wait, I have, I have the, you know, I have the, uh, enough material to build an alternative story. And if I was more susceptible to believing in a concrete way, the results of my, of my own altered states experiences, I might have a whole counter narrative about being an abductee or, you know, being whatever it is. And so there's a whole shadow world of material that, that very much takes the form of physical reality or some kind of, you know, actual experience. So that's all happening there too. So I'm, I'll, I'll get to drugs, but I'm, I wanted to talk about another, you know, um, category of altered states in ufology that is really important. And that's this hypnosis thing. So then there's a third element. So we have the positive guys who are like, we're using it to uncover the truth. Then you have the debunkers. Okay. This is just like people are inventing these stories The the therapists are inventing these stories, which is of course what, many psychologists concluded 
around recovered memory using hypno hypnosis and then you know there's the counter conspiracy that those people are actually dupes that are covering up the existence of actual you know satanic rit uh, ritual abuse and this isn't even talking about QAnon this is well before that that they're drawing off the same uh, kinds of motifs and then there's sort of a third level which is that people can actually use this this capacity this fiction making capacity as another order of control so that then you get into kind of mind control stuff so it's not that they're that these events are actually happening but that the somewhere between the media or some kinds of dark information agencies or new technologies that we're not aware of is that people are being if you will tricked into these having these kinds of experiences the experiences themselves aren't true but the event and their conviction in, in, in it is ev or is a reflection of these other kinds of manipulations of altered states of these kind of shadow states that are always there you know, our, our, we're only a, a step or two away from hypnagogia or hypnotism or hypnotic states, you know, even in our in our daily lives. So that's all already happening. Drugs then, in a way, you know, amplify this or take it in a different kind of direction. I've already mentioned that you start doing drugs, psychedelics, cannabis. Um, you're going to open up to more alternative models of how things are working. That's part of the the fun of being stoned is like, wow, maybe these things fit together or like, what's the deeper meaning of this movie I'm watching? Maybe this is actually an encoded message. Like that kind of stoner thinking is, is sort of part of the fun for at least some people. Not everybody goes down these roads, but a lot of people do. And so then you start developing a whole culture around that, going back to the occult revival, late 60s, early 70s, all this stuff. And it's right around that time that you get the whole – Eric von Donneken, enormous popular book, you know, Chariot of the Gods, Chariots of the Gods. And it's this idea that the aliens today were really the ancient gods that were animating the myths from Sumer and it helped explain all these anomalies in the history of mythology. And it's, you know, from a historical perspective, not a very solid argument, but it's a very imaginatively rich book. It was very popular. It doesn't mean everyone who was reading it believed it, but it started to open up a kind of parallel world where it was just kind of fun and interesting and possibly very significant to consider these alternative hypotheses in the face of mainstream secular conventional de debunking. So the drug culture allowed a place for the UFO memes to just keep on bubbling. And if you look at 70s progressive rock, there's tons of stuff about UFOs and, and you know, altered d different mythologies and uh, you know, a whole kind of world where this is sort of just part of the imaginal landscape. Um, so that's kind of, you know, going on. But then there's something also interesting is when you start having UFOs in psychedelic experiences. Um, an obvious one here is, uh, is Terrence McKenna's experiences in the early 1970s. And McKenna's experiences are really important because for the bulk of his life, McKenna thought UFOlogy and UFO believers were total kooks. He had no respect for contemporary UFOlogy. He thought it was all just, uh, you know, CIA goofery. Like it was just like, hey, cool, UFO people, let's mess with their memes and see how we can control their their sense of reality. Uh, not a, a not an un unintelligent interpretation of what's going on, at least at, at some level, at least from my view, I do think that there's definitely fingerprints of manipulation that's going on for a variety of possible reasons we might want to speculate about. Nonetheless, in in uh, McKenna's own, you know, mother of all trips, peak experience in La Chirera, UFOs play a really significant uh, role, not just in the main experience, but in the subsequent uh, weeks after the event. So that's a very interesting point. What is the UFO doing in his own uh, his own trips. And here it's maybe interesting to stop a little bit and think about how McKenna at the time interpreted his UFO encounter. And it's very interesting because it, it, it underscores this meta level that I'm talking about, this reflexive element where you can't just stay on the surface. You have to start looping between the surface and some deeper account. So 
McKenna sees like a classic UFO, these lenticular clouds in the horizon combine together and then they become a flying saucer with beeping multicolored lights and it flies over his head and it's got a whooshing woo-woo sound from science fiction movies. And then he thought about it later and he realized that actually the, the, the UFO that he had seen was very much like a, a, some famous hoax photo- photographs of UFOs because, of course, hoaxing has always been part of this culture as well. I haven't really talked about that, but that's part of the fun is let's make a, let's make a fake UFO photo and see how far we can, we can take it or take, make a fake UFO film and see how much we can stir, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural imagination. So McKenna realizes like, wow, that's just like that. So most people would go, okay, so I was having some crazy experience and my imagination reached, rummaged through my memories and found this uh, this image from a hoax uh, photograph and then crafted my contemporary experience out of this, uh, you know, idea that I already had in my mind. But McKenna doesn't make that conclusion. Instead, he says, no, what I encountered, this overmind, this being of this extraterrestrial intelligence in, in, in some of his accounts, in many of his accounts, this extraterrestrial intelligence was using the contents of my own memory including science fiction movies, including hoax photographs. It was using that almost like putting together building blocks in order to tell a story. It was using that as a way to communicate with me. So you see how meta this is getting. It's like the surface story is not true, but that doesn't mean it's just fabrication. It means that the fabrication is being done for by some other force. So it's very loopy. But it's not just... Uh, 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 kept within the category of hippie freaks who are raised on science fiction like like uh, McKenna. If you go into the imagery of Pablo Amaringo, the, the you know famous um, ayahuasca painter, you know sort of the first great uh, ayahuasca painter to come out uh, at a time when when ayahuasca was not popular and not well known. Uh, by people outside, even people within the drug culture, where it was sort of this fabled, enchanted uh, world down in, in in South America. Very few people had first, you know, had contact with it, and yet within that imagery, you also come across UFOs. And indeed, there are images of kind of future cities and aliens and uh, advanced medicine and strange craft. And those you can find within ayahuasca accounts by mestizos. I don't want to claim that it's definitely within strictly indigenous cultures, because I'm not absolutely sure that's true, uh, but it's definitely in the mestizo culture. So that's, it's sort of already part of like the ayahuasca space and certainly by now it is like fully a part of the ayahuasca space where the alien or the ufo or even the gray or the um uh you know different kinds of uh uh, the you know kind of the praying mantis which is often associated with kind of extraterrestrial uh, that there's sort of an archetypal collective uh, room for those images and stories and characters now, but it's been there for a long time, like longer almost than you would think it should be there. But um, I mean, that's a whole interesting question. I mean, I think you can also see the the evident or the the arising of UFO imagery inside um, these cultures as you know being their own way of connecting with the modern, with with me, with contemporary media, even at a time where they're getting much less of it. Than we do, it, we ha- we were getting in the West, uh, uh, and of course now everything's different. But but even back then, it's sort of a it's a way of of you know that ayahuasca also wants to be modern. You know, it's not just about going back to the ancient stories, even for people who are in a more qu- quasi traditional uh, environment. Um, many many. Uh, decades ago. So that that part of it then kind of supports it. And then you get these feedback loops going. And that's really the what makes things so difficult now is there's just so many feedback loops where people are taking drugs and seeing things that are kind of based on expectations they already had based on other people's experiences. And then it's you know circulated through an internet where people are making YouTube videos and cry da 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 and it goes up and da 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 da. Then entertainment industries are taking advantage of that to put out documentaries and people within the government are using those stories in order to nudge other things. So we're, we're it's like we're we're caught in all of these uh, loops 
And it, it's, it's, you know, I think it's just vital to become aware of what's happening as like, that's the message is to become aware of the complexity of how reality is constructed personally, psychologically, consciously, collectively, politically, technologically, in terms of media. That's the message. Whereas if you start going for what's actually happening here, what's the truth? That's the honeypot. Um, and, and we and so that's where you go. You, when you get the New York times article, you're like, Oh my God, the New York times, but you're like, yeah, but these are some guys They who they were, what, what are they doing? What are their agenda? What are they going to do? You got to keep on that, um, that, you know, high agnosticism, I believe, uh, if you're going to go into these realms and not just find yourself kind of stuck. Uh, it makes me think of a white headline, uh, seek simplicity and distrust it. That's great. I like that. And to dig a little bit more on the, the shadow work side, you actually turned me on. I didn't know Carl Jung had written an essay on flying saucers. I was wondering how that might play into this collective unconsciousness explanation around this. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was it's a very significant book. Uh, he was the first person really to take it seriously as a sort of psychological figure, as a as an archetype in his terms. Um Although it's, it's also interesting to point out or important to point out that at, at this point in his life, this is towards the end of his life, he was increasingly putting forward a, you know, unquestionably paranormal possibility, which is that there is something that, that events in the psyche can actually change the state of matter. And he called this psychoid. Uh, and this, of course, flies in the face of Western science. And most of his... Most of his life, he kind of played a game where he was performing as a scientist, data analysis, uh, respect for you know uh, physical reality, for uh, medical reality, etc. And then he was also kind of this archetypal psycho- psychological wizard inside. But towards the end of, the, of his life, he he, he kind of ha- almost had to by the course of his own thinking, sort of weave these start to weave these things together and synchronicity is another example of this. For him, synchronicity was evidence for this intertwingling of psychic reality and material reality. That's why the physical things seem to happen in your in space time, but they're telling a story about some psychologically meaningful event. And when that meaning gets just too overwhelming to believe that it's mere chance, then you're in this psychoid realm where these two things are crossing. And he also, he didn't say for sure, but he suggested that the UFO might have this character as well. In some ways, a very, you know, useful, interesting idea, especially if you, like me, like to keep your, you know, your mind open about these things. Um, you know, I want to I emphasize that, that while most of what I say is kind of skeptical and critical where I'm trying to understand how the whole system is working and, you know, how people are sort of fooled by their own perceptions and things. This is not in service of just a, a, a blanket debunking. I actually think that there is an anomalous dimension of reality and that part of its feature is that we can't understand what's going on. Like it's a real mystery. Like we don't get it. We, we try and what we mostly get are reflections of our presuppositions. Uh, and so I do think that there's something going on here. And that you, if you read, if you just sit down and read account after account after account after account, I mean, it's, I don't believe it's, uh, uh, you know, parsimonious to, to, in the, to the end, write it all off as mere psychology. Um, so it's, that's sort of my tricky place. I mean, it, it could, you have, you, it could be, you can be problematized, but that's sort of where I, where I come from. And Jung kind of opens up that story. And then other people come along later, Jacques Vallée, uh, it does a much more, um, you know, sort of specifically focused and also folklorically informed argument about the connection between these contemporary events and these earlier folkloric encounters with fairies or angels or lights in the sky. And that kind of carries forward uh, that Jungian thing. And an, another book along these lines that people don't talk about too much, but I think is a really great one, um, is a book called Angels and Aliens, UFOs and the Mythic Imagination by Keith Thompson. And I think that also has a really 
uh, he, he's, he's coming from a very interesting place where he's open to the power of these stories, but sort of resisting getting sucked into them. And he sees the way that this kind of mythic dimension is sort of reawakened in, in ufology. And you think about it that way, like when we use the word myth, we're just, you know, in, in, in sort of average speech, that means just a fiction. Oh, that's a myth, you know, or it's a, maybe it's an old fiction, but, but it generally just means that. But that's, that's in a way not, not, it's not giving mythology as a distinct process it's due because the, these myths were real. They said something about the way human beings connected to reality, to non-human uh, uh, powers, to the environment, to the cosmos. And there's sort of a deep pattern that's being both gestured to and expressed through mythology. So if there was re a genuine mythological reawakening in the contemporary world, that wouldn't just mean that there's some new story that everybody's talking about. It would mean that the um, quality and character of people's experiences and the kind of cosmological dimension of those experiences was going to, you know, go through a significant shift away from a kind of modern secular view that has no place for mythology except as a more or less convenient fiction. And so I think that mythological approach in the strong sense, not in the write it off as a fiction sense, but in the strong sense, that mythological approach that was inaugurated by Jung is a very fruitful one uh, to, you know, within which to, to look at these experiences and to look and pay attention to the meaning that people make from them. Maybe we don't know or never will know what's, gonna, what's going on, at least behind some of these experiences. Well, what do you do with that? What do you make of that? Do you become conspiratorial? Do you become obsessed with the idea that there is a revealed truth? And if you just line up your, 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 your research in the right way, you're going to be able to discover it. Do you allow it to work on your own worldview so that things shifts and openings happen? I think that's kind of what, what Strieber is talking about when he tries to sort of make a place for these horrific experiences in a kind of larger, more holistic, more imaginal uh, view you know, what are you going to do with it? And, and we kind of have the responsibility to, uh, to be aware of how we interpret because those interpretations, particularly in these kinds of tricksy realms, those interpretations spin around and affect us in turn. And that you can see that very much in psychedelic experience as well, where very similar kinds of looping processes are going on. So with all of those layers, how does this play into what you see happening in the current world of conspiracy theories and information and disinformation? I think that uh, in a lot of ways, the, the UFO world is a really good place to, it's like, especially if you're not particularly into it, if you're not, you know, if you're not like already a believer or you've already spent, I mean, if you have spent a lot of time kind of studying it, that, that, that's, that, that'll still work, but. Well, what I mean is, is that it, it's almost like a Petri dish where you can see a lot of the same elements that are at play in, say, QAnon, which is in a way its own thing. Like it, it's part of a, a larger shift towards conspiracyism that we've seen over the last, you know, whatever, decades. Uh, and, and it's kind of its own thing, but it's kind of related. So, it, I, I, But I don't want to go into those details right here, but just to stay with... Uh, the, the way that the UFO zone is kind of a Petri dish because you can go back and you look at it historically and you say, ah, you know, just at the, you know, and the UFO happens in the year that the CIA is reborn as the CIA from the OSS. And immediately there are these sorts of information, disinformation games that start going on. There's a sense that there's something that the government knows that it's not disclosing. So there's this desire to reveal, again, that lot where there's a surface story and you want to pe peel back the, the veil and see the reality, see the man behind the curtain. But the man behind the curtain knows that this is part of the game and is playing, starts to play their own game. So, you know, even though maybe most of the Air Force brass at one point decided the UFOs were just weren't there, and it wasn't really worth looking at. They still had to kind of play this public relations game. And then they were like, well, actually, we can use this public relations game because we can use it as, as cover for advanced 
weaponry. So even in that very secular view, you start to see the way that reality gets played with um, along these lines of information, disinformation, control, secrecy, who's in the know, hey, and, you know, you know, so you have outsider researchers who are putting the pieces together and accusing, you know, the government, the big, the, the, you know, the big father, oh, you've got this stuff hidden away in your closet, let's reveal it. So you have all that going on. And then you also have this kind of phantasmic uh, dimension to it. You know, it's no accident that again, in, that the, the core of like a QAnon belief is animated by the phantasm of this satanic, satanic child abuse, because that's also this sort of archetypal traumatic event, if you will, in the, in, in the imagination. I'm not saying it doesn't happen sometimes, clearly any, almost anything you can imagine human beings doing within, within natural capacities, they're going to do sometimes. So uh, you know, that, leave leave that one, you know, uh, open in that sense. But as a phantasm, it's incredibly powerful. And, in, and indeed, we find that related with, with uh, you know, in relationship to the kind of abduction phantasm. So you have that stuff going on there uh, as well, as well as this idea that behind secular forces like the government or the military lie these higher, more cosmic or supernatural agencies and that's something else you find with ufology but then also with a lot of conspiracies where on one level it's the trilateral commission and the bilderbergs and the rothschilds and the, the globalists but then right behind that is satan or the the you know the uh, the lizards from orion or whatever the kind of supernatural or the the archons from gnostic cosmology that they're kind of right behind these secular figures. So you can see all this stuff within the UFO zone and then see the way that it's resonating or sets up or feeds into uh, a number of other conspiracies and, cons and conspiratorial worldviews that are now, you know, seemingly so prevalent. That leads to a practical question I actually wanted to end with. You, you suggest doing your research and using this to, to learn more about how the world works, but it gets very dark, the material that you start wading through in any of these worlds, including the UFO one. So what do you do to kind of protect your mind state when you're looking at some of the darkness that comes out of this? And also, what advice would you have for critical thinking as people start diving into a world like this one? Yeah, that's a that's a really... That's a really good question, and it's it's one that I'm just kind of figuring out myself. Um, in in the sense that, partly I, I think I have a certain kind of temperament that, for better and for worse. I mean, I may be missing things, and I I'm I'm sure that for some listeners, what I've said has been very irritating because I'm not going one way or another. Um, but the the development of a kind of fascinated and curious agnosticism where you are willing to take on the dark dimensions of things but not take them on, take them on personally so much is I think part of a well in some ways it's part of a, a deeper commitment to understanding and also to almost kind of filtering or transmuting some of this darkness um, that the very, you know, my commitment to humor, irony, um, fascination, curiosity with the world, fearlessness, uh, a willingness to be in difficult situations and not believe that there is a easy way out, that all of those elements are a kind of you know, it's building up a certain ability to go into the, the, uh, the underground, you know, to, I mean, not in the, the sociological sense, but to go into the mythic cave, if you will, where there are, where there are monsters. Um, and that's not for everybody. Uh, some people get too caught up in the monsters and then they're gone and they're just like, all they can do is talk about all the evil forces and they're just sort of taken over by these, these memes. I mean, in a way you can think about memes as sort of a, information society analog of demons, angels, and sprites. They're sort of non-human stories that 
come alive, and especially they come alive if you feed them. Uh, and so you have to become kind of aware of your own relationship to them. That's the, the problem is that people collapse and they feel like, oh, now I've got the truth. Oh, or I put all these pieces together and like it looks really clear to me that it's X. Well, okay, that's happening to you, but that doesn't mean you got to serve X. That means, you know, you, the, 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 the need to maintain your own autonomy. It's like you're being a warrior of the weird uh, is, is really key. And rather than capitulation, like, oh my God, I always thought the world was this way. And now I, I think that it's this way. That must be right. Which is always the part that never, that I never understood with any kind of conspiracies. Like here's the mainstream world. It's like, we're trying, you know, for a variety of forces, some good, some not so good are trying to maintain some kind of consensus reality or fight about consensus reality, but within a certain kind of larger consensus game field. And I, I, I think it's a noble effort. And I, I really support a lot of those guys, scientists, contemporary experts, psychologists, whatever. But it clearly isn't entirely working and it's not really covering the whole story. So if you start to grow skeptical of that story, well, I don't really know if that's true anymore. Maybe that I've just been told a lie. So then you go one layer in and you start watching YouTube videos and you start, and you, there's something that attracts you. Why does that attract you? Why did you get into the flat earth and not the satanic cabal? Or are you, are you one of those people who, who puts it all together? Because when you meet somebody who believes all conspiracies, they self-defeat. It doesn't make sense. So why are you drawn to this one and that one? So now you're on an imaginal, you know, you're, you're on a journey now. And what happens to a lot of people, and I think this is one of the main traps, is that you have just enough skepticism to break through, you know, to swallow your red pill. And, and, and crack out of the matrix. But instead of realizing that now you are on a path where skepticism is part of the path, you instead recrystallize around a new belief because the vertigo of being on a path with skepticism is overwhelming and can be overwhelming, confusing. You don't know where to turn. Where is, is, there, is there any truth anymore? Have I lost my mind? You know, are my dreams taking over? It, makes, it can get really hairy. It's the same thing with like heavy psychedelic use is not going to help that process. But at the, you know, one thing you should not do is then satisfy that anxiety by crystal, crystallizing around a new belief that doesn't get subjected to the same degree of skepticism. And that's, I think, one of the main things that, that happens to people. And to do that, you've got to grow. You got to become able to withstand that degree of, of uh, confusion or, or, or lack of clarity and also to build trust in yourself and to build trust, I believe, in ordinary empirical reality. And by that, I don't mean, quote unquote, consensus reality that's telling you the rules of what's true and what's not true. I mean, like, your body that shits and eats and you make love and you're, you're getting older and you're going to die. You like animals, you know, trees are cool, that world. And that world to me is, is it's incredibly important to maintain relationship to it, even if it's unpleasant, you know, even if it's unpleasant, because that's the ground. And at some point we're going to lose that too. But for now, that is a place to kind of modulate all of these visions. And I think part of what happens to people now is they, they're, you know, they're physically uncomfortable. They're in a, they're in a very anxious environment. They're, they're cut off from people. They're in front of their computers. They're in front of their phones. There's nothing else to do. And they go down these informational rabbit holes and they almost like disincarnate and, 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 and become sort of a detached sub astral being floating around all of these information matrices and they're just it's just like raw meat it's easy so you got to get back to the meat that's the thing that people forget about the matrix okay the red pill thing has been you know this big metaphor for you know awakening and it's been taken over by the by the alt right or the right wing is like breaking out of like uh, the the mainstream media liberal uh, propaganda world and waking up to what's really going on that might be QAnon there might be some other you know kind of right wing conspiratorial narrative so they've sort of weaponized that model but what actually happens in the friggin movie the awakening means waking up to a shitty material circumstance in, in a dark situation. You're not alone. You got friends. You, you got a struggle. 
you got a real struggle, you know, and then we see how that struggle evolves in the films. But but to take just to stay in the first movie, you you have to be eating crappy food and not wanting to eat the steak. Part of you wants to eat the steak. You want to go back in the matrix or you want to think that X and Y are happening because it makes things easier to withstand. But instead, here you are in front of your computer, down another rabbit hole, another YouTube video from some other person who's probably just as lonely and freaked out as you are. And you're in your body and you're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to eat? Am I going to work out today? Am I going to meditate today? That world has to be very alive and cooking in your reality if you're going to go into these realms with with open eyes and not just get caught in some kind of um, meme plex that then sort of starts to make decisions for you. So a spiritual quest, but your body is your armor. Your connection to your body is your armor. And and your critical, you know, and developing this kind of generalized uh, skepticism. You know, that because you re- that that's part of the trick. The conne- there's a connection between skepticism and the body, which is that, okay, yeah, I can be skeptical about my body. Okay, I'm not really in a physical body. Maybe I'm a brain in a vat. Or everything I see is just a construct of my brain that it's, you know, doing predictive programming. And so, it's, you know, the, the, the sunset really isn't orange. The leaves aren't really green. It's just a fa- fabrication. So, the, yeah, there's that kind of skepticism. But the kind of skepticism I'm talking about, which is about narratives and claims and reality constructs and cosmologies, that is connected, your ability to withstand the, the ambiguity of those things is in relationship to your, your comfort and your support in your physical frame, including the humor of being in the body. I mean, it's an absurd situation. It's hilarious. It farts. You know, you want to have sex. Why? What is this, is this good? You know, whatever. Like, oh, this is fun. It's absurd. You know, like, where did that go? You know, I mean, it's just a, it's a very amusing situation in a way and and a, and a tragic one too and a sad one but you're connected to the concrete dimension of that tragic comedy in the body and it's 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 like ballast it gives you ballast and it enables you to not feel like you need to believe as many things well what happens if i just don't try to believe what if i not make up my, don't make up my mind in a like lazy way. Well, I don't want, I just don't want to make up my mind, but like really not know. But if you're in your body, you can really not know and be okay. Cause you, you know, you still want to go and, you know, have a fruit shake and make love to your girlfriend. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of ballast that I think a lot of people now uh, are, are, are losing connection with. Yes, I am. Uh, Dostoevsky said, if the universe made sense, nothing would ever happen. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. You've had, you've had a couple of great singers. I want, uh, cause I know Um, you're like a, you're like a collector of, of awesome quotes. Yeah. Yeah. I gave myself carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm writing them all down. (laughs) Well, Dr. Eric Davis, thank you so much for sharing on these subjects today. We're going to have all the links to your work and your books in the episode notes, but I just want to say it's such a pleasure. And I know you have a lot of other topics you study even more deeply than this one. And so it'd be great to have you back again to talk uh, another time. Hey, Lex, it's been great. I always like talking with you. Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, find us at pluscbdoil.com or on YouTube or on all the podcast platforms. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com or follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex Files Show. If you enjoyed this program, please rate us on iTunes or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. Our chief advisor is Amabel Dela Cruz. The music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. And our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. Remember the coupon code LexFiles. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off. <laughs>